PhD, professor of Old Testament at Union Theological Seminary this evening, in just a few moments. I wanted to mention um, we don't have um, any more official lectures, Talene lectures this year, but we do have, um, we are co-sponsoring an important event that will be held, um, co-sponsoring with the Cassandra Voss Center on April 17th at six o'clock in the Walter Theater. We'll be welcoming Sister Joan Chibister. If you do not know who Sister Joan Chibister is, you should. She's a phenomenal woman, um, a prophet of our time, I would say. And she's coming with one of our former uh, students, one of our graduates, um, Brianna McCooley, and they'll be um, in dialogue together talking about from certainty to faith, um, Sister Joan Chibister in dialogue. So I would encourage you to put that on your calendars and to come to that. That's on April 17th at 6 o'clock. Next year, we begin a new lecture series. Our theme next year will be community and technology. Um, and we have a diverse slate of speakers lined up who will be approaching philosophical and theological questions surrounding our current technological age of instant and near total connection and communication. So watch for mailings and emails and whatnot on the, on the um, details of that for next year. Um, following Dr. Carr's lecture this evening, we'll have a brief period of question and answer. And um, then if after those questions you wish to continue the conversation further, we would invite you outside to the lobby for some light refreshments. And with that, I'd now like to invite my colleague in theology and religious studies, Dr. Tom Bolin, to the podium to introduce our guest. Thanks. Good evening. I'm thrilled to introduce David Carr. He's professor of Old Testament at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. He received his BA in philosophy uh, from Carleton College, an MTS from Emory University's Candler School of Theology, and an MA and a PhD in religion from Claremont Graduate University. He is the recipient of uh, prestigious scholarship, uh, fellowships, including the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. Professor Carr's teaching and research interests include the formation and shape of the Bible, sexuality and gender in the Bible, the intersection of historical, critical, and literary approaches to the Bible, the emergence of scripture in the Jewish and Christian traditions, orality, memory, and trauma studies. His work is uh, characterized by clarity, creativity, and rigor. Among his books, and I've read most of these, and I can tell you they're all excellent, <laughs> um, are Reading the Fractures of Genesis, Historical and Literary Approaches, The Erotic Word, Sexuality, Spirituality, and the Bible, Writing on the Tablet of the Heart, Origins of Western Scripture and Literature, The Formation of the Hebrew Bible, A New Reconstruction, Holy Resilience, The Bible's Traumatic Origins, copies of which we have available outside. And he's currently writing a commentary on the first 11 chapters of Genesis for a new uh, commentary series called the International Exegetical Old Testament Commentary. So please give a warm welcome to David Carr. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I want to say also thank you to the organizers of the Killeen Lecture Series and to St. Norbert College for the hospitality and this chance to be with you this evening. I've had a wonderful stay, and I'm excited about this chance to talk with you all. Now, um, let me just be up front at the outset. Uh, when you're invited to do something like this, it's always tempting to choose something that you've you've published on before and done lots of lectures on before. Wh so I might have, say, done something on trauma, and hopefully that might have been interesting to you too, and, and that relates to the book that's outside. But I decided to use this opportunity instead to share with you some work that I'm currently working on. This is a sort of a research report in this sense um, related to my commentary that I'm writing on Genesis uh, because I just find it an amazingly rich material. But that means that the material is not quite as polished or smooth as it might otherwise be. I've done my best to try to get this ready. Um, and I also am not just going to be reading from a text, although I have notes here. So I don't know exactly how the timing will work out, but I hope that as I'm going, you'll make some notes and maybe be ready to ask me a few quick questions of clarification or something as I go forward, because there's a lot to talk about in this text. Um, so uh, with that prelude, um, let me just start on working through this um, story, which is actually one of the most um, Im interpreted stories of transformative experience in the Western and biblical canon. 
the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 through 3. I hope that if you hadn't had a chance to familiar to know the story before, that you've taken a little bit of a chance to do that before I started. There's a, lec- there's a handout with my translation for, for, from the commentary that was circulated, and you also had a chance to have a few images and quotes related to the story up on the screen. Um, But just briefly, the Garden of Eden story tells of God's creation of human beings, male and female, and animals in a paradise garden. It tells of God forbidding them to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, lest you certainly die. I'll return to that in a little bit. It tells of a snake convincing the woman to take another look at that forbidden fruit and eat it, and then her man eats it, who it turns out to have been with her the whole time. And it also tells of God then cursing the snake, um, pronouncing punishment on the woman and the man, and expelling the humans from the garden of paradise to live a hard life outside the garden, sort of this is hard everyday life that we all know, forever excluded from being able to eat of the tree of immortality in the garden, and live forever. So they lose, they, never, they lose a chance at immortality that they never knew they had. It's a story about profound transformations at the outset of human life. It's a story about how humans grew up, moving from a childlike, dependent state of being naked and running around uh, without any self-consciousness about it, sort of like kids can do, to a place where They're beginning to live as adults, having to work really hard to secure their food, and for women, enduring a long series of pregnancies to have children to secure their future. Now, that might be as far as things go. Uh, It's an ancient story to be read by theologians, priests, college professors, students who have it assigned, perhaps. But I'm inviting you to take another look at this text um, as a wise account that might also speak across time about what it means to be a true adult. And I do this not just because I'm an Old Testament scholar or because the story's been influential in the past and present, although it has, but I'm doing it because I'm ever more convinced that we all must make choices about the stories we tell about ourselves. And this story of transformation at the outset of the Bible offers more than one might first suppose about an account of what it means to be a human being. Now, as we get into this story, I think it's useful to get a sense of some of the lens we might be reading it through, and we need to acknowledge that, depending on the person in this room, and we've got a diverse group, many of us have encountered this story before, and, and the traditional readings of this story often read it as a story of original sin about uh, how humans from the very outset made a fundamentally wrong decision that meant that humans were flawed from then on. That's a very flat reading, I realize, of of the original sin reading, but it sort of gets at the the reading of this story as a story of a fall. You should also know that there's been a reaction among some scholars to that reading so that there's some scholars out there uh, who would argue instead that the story's actually a completely positive story of human enlightenment, of gaining liberation, that God never would have intended for humans to remain forever in a childlike dependent state. And so in a sense, it was already stacked from the outset toward its outcome, and it was a good outcome that happened. And arguments one way or another on this story are, in a sense, I would argue, arguments about who we are at our core. To simplify, are we at core just broken? Or are we from the outset good and destined for greatness? Now, before I go further, let me just acknowledge also that if, if, as I try to think about this talk, and I imagine myself in your seat, if, if I had been convinced to come to a lecture like this while I was in college, my thought would be, this is not one of the texts in the Bible I would have preferred to learn more about. Um, It was not at all one of my favorites. Uh, If you know the Bible, and I actually didn't know it all that well, but what I knew of the Bible, I would have much preferred to come to a lecture on Amos' prophecy of social justice, say, or 
the complex, multi-voice treatment of the problem of evil in the book of Job. Or there are lots of other candidates uh, of what I would have, would have chosen to focus on. But I'm, sharing, I'm talking about this text tonight because I found, even though I started out disliking this story, as I've read it year after year, indeed decade after decade, I've found that it's a story that bears rereading, that it ripens in a sense as you get to know it better, that it just continually opens up, uh, sort of like maybe a wine, you know, that if you just let it air out for a while, you suddenly discover there's a d whole different dimension to it. So anyway, um, so uh, I'm going to talk through the story. Um, and because I realize there are different levels of familiarity with it, um, the next part, part of the talk will walk through different parts of it. Before I get to that, though, I want to talk some about, and I realize here I'm gonna, I might do this a few times through this, is that I'm so busy talking to you I forget to do my slideshow. Um, but I want to talk about um, how the Garden of Eden story actually responds to some earlier creation stories that were found in the Near East, that were written a thousand or more years before the Garden of Eden story was written. And the reason why, I would say, is because it wasn't written in a vacuum. Like many texts, it was written as part of an ongoing conversation. And knowing the precursors and ancient themes that preceded the Garden of Eden story, I would argue, is it's important for understanding it as having it translated from Hebrew. Um, knowing some of these things, I'd suggest, can clarify some puzzling aspects of the story, such as, so what is it with this tree of knowledge and tree of immortality or life? What, what do they mean? What are, what are they about? Why is a snake so important in the story? Now, I realize some of you may have been a, I, encountered readings where the snake is Satan or the devil, but that's not in the biblical text. Also, what is it about clothing in the text? Why is there such a focus on humans making clothing for themselves and God clothing them later? And also, this might seem obvious on first reading, but it turns out to be somewhat puzzling in the end. Why does God end up sending humans from the garden? So before I get to the Garden of Eden story, bear with me for a bit as I quickly survey some traditions from the Near East that I realize are unfamiliar to many of you. And because they are, I'm going to use a fair amount of text on the PowerPoint so you can hopefully stay oriented to where I am. I'm not a big fan of lots of text on PowerPoint, but for this part, I'm going to use it. And you don't need to pick up all the details, but hopefully you'll get something out of it. So first of all, I would want to mention that the traditions that the Garden of Eden story relates to particularly connect to creation traditions from Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia is this uh, area it's actually um, an area that's mostly coincident with what is now known as Iraq, but also touches on parts of Syria and parts of Turkey as well. It's an a arid plain watered by two major ri rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, and uh, there are several different kinds of themes I want to highlight in relation to the Garden of Eden story. Of course, there's lots I could talk about, and that would be a separate lecture. But first of all, um, one of the themes that unites a lot of the creation traditions in ancient Mesopotamia is a focus on talking about the origins of irrigation agriculture. This is some irrigation agriculture in the Tigris-Euphrates plain. Um, you know, you'd think a creation story would just be like a lot of the biblical ones, talk about the making of sun and moon and stars and animals and that sort of thing. But creation stories in Mesopotamia talk first and foremost about irrigation agriculture. And then they sometimes talked about some of these other themes. Another theme that comes up, and this is important in um, Mesopotamia, is the idea that humans were created <coughs> to take over the work of canal digging and hard work of farming from the lower gods who'd been doing that work beforehand. So the idea here is that earlier, there were a bunch of lower gods who were just working their butts off making, doing canals and farming and that sort of thing, and they protest to the higher gods, and the higher gods deal with it by creating humans, basically as slaves, to make the food and keep the canals dug out for, and make sure the uh, gods are fed. Um, 
And then there's this third set of themes, a little bit more complex, but it'll be relevant with the Garden of Eden story. And that is that a lot of these Mesopotamian, not a lot, but a few of these Mesopotamian creation stories talk about the creation of humans as a process. It's not just like a one-time deal. For, so there's this initial stage where humans were sort of proto-human, childlike, naked, um, and then they gradually get to a place where they become civilized. For example, an early Sumerian king list text speaks of an early time before kingship was lowered from heaven, when humans lived incredibly long lives, but they lived outside, herded animals, and they lacked tools, liquor, and knowledge of irrigation. And then it goes on to describe how a god founded agriculture and then subsequent rulers of a Mesopotamian city, in this case it was named Lagash, established the canal irrigation system and various forms of civilization. Or another text talks about a pre-creation time where there were kings, before there were kings, describing it as a period when there was neither herding of sheep or growing of grain, and humans ran around naked drinking water from ditches and eating grass. So you're starting to see some common themes here. Notice there's an emphasis on, like, drinking water is pretty civilized. You know, you drink it, you, you, if you... If you're not adult or whatever, you drink water, but when you grow up, you drink beer. <laughs> anyway, the gods gave humanities both sheep and grain, with the grain produced by field, beard, field irrigation agriculture being named the ultimate gift. Now, we see some of this idea of a gradual transition from proto-human life to full human life in one of the most famous Mesopotamian texts, I'll refer to it twice here. It's the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the story of Gilgamesh mostly focuses on Gilgamesh, but early in the story we hear a bit about his best friend, Enkidu, who's initially created by the goddess Aruru. And he's a wild man. He's hairy, he runs naked, he associates with the animals, <coughs> eats wild vegetation, um, and drinks water from ditches. <coughs> and then later, um, a Gilgamesh sends a prostitute named Samhat to civilize him, and she civilizes him by having sex with him for six days and nights. I'm not sure how that all works, but anyway, <laughs> that's how the story goes. And when he, after he's done with this, he goes and finds that the animals run away from him. Um, they don't want to associate with him anymore. He loses his community with them. He puts on clothes, drinks beer, anoints himself, and is praised as wise like a god. So again, Enkidu becomes a human, a full human over time. Human creation is a process. All right, I'm, I'm going to get to the Eden story soon, but I have two more quick stories to share that are quite relevant to the Eden story. Um, first of all, um, there are s uh, two stories, well, these, both of these stories relate to semi-divine humans losing a chance at godlike immortality. The first story I want to talk about comes again from the Gilgamesh epic, who after G Enkidu dies, a spoiler alert there, um, <laughs> he, he, Gilgamesh is so upset and he starts searching for some form of immortality. And he eventually finds it in the form of a plant that will provide eternal youth. And uh, so he's very excited. Before he goes home to his town Uruk to give the old people the plant of eternal youth, he decides it's a good idea to go for a, a swim in a pool. And he leaves the plant on the beach. And as he's in the pool, a snake comes and eats the plant and sheds its skin and leaves. So in a sense, this plant of eternal youth has made it possible for snakes to shed their skin and gain new ones. Gilgamesh comes out of the pool, discovers the, the old skin of the snake, and weeps realizing he's lost his chance at immortality. Another story is an, another epic, the epic of Adapa. Um, Adapa um, is a s wise, godlike hero who gets in a dispute with the gods, goes to heaven to resolve it, and when he speaks wisely and well in heaven, the high god, Anu, commissions the snake god, Ningashida, don't worry, there won't be a quiz on all these names, um, but quiz, um, 
commissions Ningashida and another deity to offer Adapa the divine food of immortality. But Adapa, before he went, made his trip to heaven, was told by his patron god Enki that the gods would try to kill him by giving him food, and he should by no means eat any food offered to him. And so on the basis of those instructions, he refuses the food of immortality that's offered to him by Ningashida and this other god, and thus unknowingly loses a chance at immortality. So interestingly enough, you can tell where I'm going here, I realize. In both of these stories, a snake plays a role in humans accidentally losing a chance at immortality they never knew they had. And in both cases, a crucial boundary between the gods and humans is reinforced. Humans can have godlike wisdom. That's true both for Gilgamesh and for Adapa. But if they have godlike wisdom, they can't also have godlike immortality. That's too much. All right. So I realize I've run through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. It's not crucial that you remember all the details here. Um, but what I would want to emphasize as a takeaway from this initial part is, first of all, that the Eden story was written as part of this broader stream of tradition. It wasn't necessarily written in Mesopotamia. It might have been uh, by Judeans living there. But it was written by people who knew those stories. Um, and moreover, I would want to emphasize that none of these stories probably should be best understood as historical accounts of actual events, like Adapa going to heaven, being offered the food of immortality, or Gilgamesh, you know, losing the plant of eternal youth to a snake. Um, or I would argue, even for the Eden story, that the Eden story isn't best read as an actual historical account of two people who had these dialogues and stuff. I realize that might be different for some of you all, but that's what I would suggest. They are what might be best understood as myths in the best sense of the word. I realize myth in, the, in our culture often means fictional, but myths in the best sense of the word, at least the best myths, are what one of my teachers, Marcus Borg, said, that myths are stories that never happened and are always true. Um, and so in that sense, at least at their best, these stories of Enkidu or Adapa, or I would argue especially the Garden of Eden story, should be read on that level as texts of wisdom. As they, and they do, as you can tell, speak of a process of becoming human, losing the chance of immortality as a process that happened over time. So let me turn now to the Garden of Eden story and its particular version of this account, which is distinctive in important ways from the stories I just described. So the story begins, um, like many Mesopotamian creation stories do, with a description of what's missing. And what's missing at the outset of the Garden of Eden story, and by the way, feel free to follow the handout here. I'm not going to talk about everything in it, but it's there to help you follow. The first verse says, Earth was miss missing vegetation, and it was missing it for two reasons. There was no rain, and there was no human to work the ground. And the word for human here is Adam in Hebrew. I realize you've probably run across Adam as a pr proper name, like Adam. But in Hebrew, it's, it's the word for human. So it's basically saying the human, ha-adam. There was no human to work the ground, adama. Um, and that becomes important for understanding the next stage, where God then makes a adam, a adam, an earth being, out of the earth. Indeed, out of the dust of the earth, which is actually kind of a puzzling expression, if you think about it. Making something out of dust. I realize God can do everything, but that's a little tougher than you know just creating a human out of clay or something and enlivening it. So that you know might trigger questions for you as a reader. I'll anticipate by saying dust within the Bible and the broader Near East is a common symbol for mortality. Um, humans are dust. And we see this at the end of the Garden of Eden story where God says, for from dust you were made, and to dust you will return. So this is a little tiny clue at the outset of the story that we're not just going to be focused on God's creation of an earth creature from the ground to work it, but also on the mortality of that earth creature. They're both bound up into one from the very outset. 
God then plants a garden in Eden. And the word Eden, uh, scholars have learned only recently over the last uh, decade or two, appears to be a word that encapsulates the idea of well-watered or luxurious, which I realize perhaps in Wisconsin or where I come from in New York is not as big a deal, but in ancient Mesopotamia, having water was crucial. Having a well-watered area was what marked something as just paradise in many ways. And so God creates, sort of plants a garden in lush land. Uh, and God, in particular, plants trees there. And trees in the ancient Near East are precious. You, you can only have them where you have a lot of consistent water and that kind of thing. And they produce a kind of ongoing fruit and stuff that doesn't require some of the same kind of work that irrigation agriculture requires. So God plants a bunch of pretty and tasty trees. And in particular, God plants two special trees. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. We don't know at this point as readers what is going on with these trees, but that's what God plants. And God then puts the human in the garden to work and guard it. Now, this is an interesting contrast with the Mesopotamian picture, if you think about it, because remember in the Mesopotamian creation text, and this is a common theme across a bunch of them, humans are created from the outset basically as slaves to the gods that work their butts off keeping canals clear and making food for the gods. But in the Garden of Eden story, God starts out by putting humans in this lush paradise garden orchard to work and protect them. It's a much different kind of life, a much easier kind of life. It involves some work, but it's a different kind of work than is involved in this other kind of um, agriculture. And this brings us to God's instructions regarding this garden orchard. First of all, God gives permission for them to eat of every tree in the garden. You may certainly eat from it. And one prohibition, but you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, lest you certainly die. I mean, I realize this is the Bible, and people might not ask questions about it, but you have to wonder, like, what's the big deal? I mean, knowledge of good and evil, isn't that normally a good thing? And... Even if it was a little bad, do you have to kill them if they eat it? Uh, so it's, you know, it sounds like a death penalty, and you just don't understand what's going on with it um, as you move forward. Um, so there's, we have that, and there's nothing further on that. But God realizes there's a problem with this garden and this situation. God's made this human and says it's not good for this human to be alone. Now, this, I could do a whole lo another lecture on the profundity of this observation. Uh, I think it has vast implications about sort of various debates we have about whether certain people can be with other people and that sort of thing. But in any case, God recognizes that it's not good for this human to be alone. And so God decides to make a helper corresponding to him. Um, and... Uh, so, and God then, then the story emphasizes how important that corresponding to him thing is because the next thing God does, and this is kind of theologically daring in terms of a biblical story, but it talks about God making animals and an attempt, in a sense, to make this corresponding helper and brings each one to the human, and the human names the animal, which is a way of sort of asserting dominion over different things. And none of the animals qualify as corresponding to the human. God only succeeds, finally, after these failed attempts at making a helper corresponding to the first human, when God takes a part of the first human while he's asleep and builds a woman out of that part. And when God finishes and brings this woman to the man, the, the man, the human, sings a song of praise saying, uh, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, this one will be called woman because she was made from man. And there's that same relation between the words in Hebrew that you see in English. It's isha and ish um, that sort of expresses the relatedness, the integral it relatedness of these two creatures, these two earth creatures now who can be together. And as the text does that, it's sort of starting to step outside. It's sort of talking about the primeval ancient time to talk about ways in which realities from that time touch on the present so that you have... Um, an expression in the song of praise of the woman, of 
her kin connection to the man, which anticipates later marriage relations because flesh of my flesh and bone are my bone are Hebrew expressions for kinship. And then this expression, expl- express um, description of it's on that account that a man abandons his mother and father in the Hebrew, that's what it says, and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. So in this way, this text is saying Eden isn't over completely. There are crucial elements from that Eden garden that persist into the present. At the same time, in our story, it's the, the human, humans are still not quite what we would think of as normal humans. The final part of chapter 2 says, and the two humans were naked and they weren't ashamed in front of each other. So there's still that sort of, there's that proto-childlike human creature still in this story. But not for long. <coughs> because we have this encounter between the snake and the woman in the first five verses of chapter 3. Um, now, as, I, as you can anticipate, it's interesting, isn't it, that the snake is the one who introduces this plot um, complication. Because we've saw, seen the snake elsewhere associated with losing chances of immortality. In the Garden of Eden story, though, the snake is not associated with immortality, being able to shed his skin immediately or whatever. The snake is described as being more clever than all the other animals of the, of the garden. So um, in this sense, the snake's associated with wisdom. And he illustrates this at the outset by having this clever dialogue with the woman, getting the woman to take another look at this forbidden fruit, saying when she says God told them that they would die if they ate it or even touched it, uh, the snake said, oh, you're not going to die if you eat this fruit. God forbade the fruit because God was afraid that you would eat the fruit and know good and evil and thereby be like God. And so the woman takes another look at this fruit um, and she realizes it's not only uh, pretty and tasty, which all the trees of the garden were said to be, but it's also good for gaining wisdom. And so she eats it and she gives the fruit to her man and he eats it too. And it turns out from the outset that the snake turns out to be right. Their eyes are opened, which is a common Near Eastern expression for gaining wisdom. So just as the snake snake predicted, they actually get wisdom from eating of the fruit. Um, And the particular kind of wisdom they get is a form of sort of self-consciousness. They realize they are naked. And then they try to make these flimsy loincloths for themselves. So it's sort of this beginning transition that there's this sort of initial childlike stage where you're just shameless in a sense. You don't worry about what people think. You don't know to worry about what people think. And then there comes this crucial transition where you start to look through the other, other people's eyes as they, as they look at you. And, they, and you start to realize, what do I look like to them? And they do that and realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm naked. Uh, and so they try to address that in their own imperfect childlike way by making leafy loincloths for themselves. Um, and then what emerges after this is, is a subtle form of alienation first seen when the humans hide from God, when God, they hear God going in the garden. And then also when God asks them what happened the way they passed the buck from one to the other. So God says, you know, did you eat of this tree which I told you not to eat? And Adam says... Well, the woman whom you gave me, God, gave to me the, of the fruit, and I ate. So you can see in that one tiny sentence that there's already a break between the human and God and the woman, who the human was just so connected to at the end of the previous chapter. And then God turns to the woman and asks what's up with this, and the human says, the snake deceived me, and I ate which is actually, th- we could go into that deeper. It's not actually clear exactly how the snake deceived her, really. But, uh, but that's what she says. God actually never gives a snake a chance to give his account of what was <laughs> up. Um, which is, you know, that would be an interesting story in itself. But um, God then moves to pronounce consequences on the different characters in this story. Starting with the snake. Um, first judging the snake, saying, because you did this, You are cursed to crawl on the ground, and enmity will be between you and humanity from here on out. 
Um, one of the people who I gave an earlier version of this lecture to pointed out to me that in the non-urbanized, undeveloped world, snakes are still more responsible for human fatalities than any other human, any other animal. And so in a sense, this text is explaining that kind of phenomenon as a result of the snake's role in this uh, process. At the end of the set of uh, speeches about consequences, God pronounces a judgment on the man as well, saying, because you ate of the fruit that I told you not to eat, and because you listened to your wife, which I think is a way of God responding to the man's excuse before, where the man said, the woman whom you gave me gave me the fruit. He said, no, that doesn't cut it. Because you did these two things, um, you're going to have to earn your food through the sweat of your brow, through hard effort all your life, till you return to the ground from which you were made. For from dust you came, and to dust you will return. So there you have this pronouncement of hard labor, um, which then sets the context for the middle pronouncement, which is to the woman, which I would want to emphasize is interesting in contrast to the pronouncements to the snake and the man, in that God doesn't tell her that she's done anything wrong. There's no critique. Um, God does, though, pronounce certain consequences of this whole event on the woman, um, and that is that uh, her supposed role in getting the man to listen to her voice is now punished by subjecting her to his rule and desire for him, interestingly enough. And God also announces that God will multiply her toil in conception and reproduction. This is often translated, if you looked at another Bible, as multiply her pain. But the exact same word is used here. It's bone uh, for the effort the woman has to make in endless conception that was used for the man's labor in making bread for himself all his life. So there are two different kinds of labor, per se. Um, and it's in a world where women in the subsistence agricultural setting had to constantly, were constantly pumping out babies, and only half of them often lived. Uh, and, but that was necessary because people in general didn't live. If people survived past two years in general, um, studies of human remains suggest that women in, in on average died in their mid-20s, about half of them in childbirth, men often in their early 30s. So it's in this context of constantly cycling generations and the desperate need of children for help in agriculture that women were subjected just constantly to the labor of reproduction. And that is attributed in this text to the rupture in creation produced by eating of the forbidden fruit. But in addition, this process of reproduction that God announces for the woman is a means through reproduction for humans to survive the mortality that God emphasizes in God's speech to the man. So in sum, what I'm emphasizing here is this story just isn't all positive. Um, although Genesis 2 to 3, like the Mesopotamian creation stories I talked about, tells a story of human maturing, of becoming fully human, it's complicated. It's bought at the cost of angering God, losing a life in God's sacred, well-watered garden that is understood in positive terms in the text, and instead being condemned to living a hard life characterized by new forms of alienation between men and women, both in God and hard farming labor and reproduction that ends in unavoidable death. So, now after uh, the human recognizes the woman's reproductive role in naming her Eve, mother of all life, God then officially recognizes and affirms this new distinction of humans as adult creatures aside from animals by making the humans real clothing, by make replacing their flimsy loincloth with body-length skin tunics that in effect become second skins for them. It's an interesting act by God that sort of certifies, God certifies that they've made this transition. It's their graduation moment of them becoming recognized as non-animal human beings, adults. And um, this sort of points out an interesting dynamic of this process. Um, the first humans reach this point. They grow up 
almost in spite of God's initial intention that humans would live naked in the Garden of Eden, tending and guarding it. The process of producing grown-up humans was something that could only happen through a interactive process of human transformation, one where humans disobeyed God's only prohibition. God could create animals and childlike proto-humans. God does that straight away. But what God apparently couldn't do, at least within the logic of the story, was create fully adult, separate decision-maker humans. That was the challenge. It is, in a way, I should say, as a parent of young adults, um, it is this crucial, delicate process parents face, too, as they work with their kids from a place where they start out in a place of childlike dependence to growing to a place, sometimes through failed decisions, into an independent adult decision maker. It's a fraught process. I can speak as a parent from that side, and maybe some of you could speak from another side in terms of experience. But this story talks about that in relation to God. It's a difficult, fraught process. But the transition to adulthood is often in adolescence, comes through rebellion from God's command. Um, and only once these humans have seized the fruit and gained knowledge are they certified as fully adult. And then once this happens, once this crucial transition has happened, a tr transition that, by the way, only happened through the participation of this corresponding partner for the human, this woman, the narrative then doesn't seem to see any need to mention her anymore. And the last few verses of chapter 3 talk exclusively about the human, the first human. That takes us to this final problem in, the, in chapter 3. God has pronounced these punishments and this sort of thing, but God, apparently speaking to what was understood in the ancient Near East as a broader council of divine beings, says, look, these humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So they've gained this godlike wisdom. What if the humans now, the human, reaches out his hand, eats of the tree of life, and lives forever? So you can see that same dynamic we saw in those earlier stories. They have godlike wisdom. What happens if they cross that other Rubicon and gain godlike immortality? And, and actually, in the text, God doesn't even finish the sentence. <laughs> God moves immediately to expelling them from the garden, um, sending them out to work the ground from which they were made, and thus fulfilling the lack that was mentioned at the beginning of the story. And then, moreover, setting guards at the gate of Eden to make sure that they can't come back and eat of the tree of knowledge. So in this, in this account, it's interesting, God isn't so much pronouncing punishment. It's almost as if God's afraid. God's worried about this human becoming too godlike and puts measures into place to prevent that from happening. And so the humans, as, you, as I anticipated at the outset, they always had access to this tree of immortality, but they didn't know it. And now they're expelled from the garden permanently and lose the chance to eat of the tree of life and gain immortality. Which then starts to explain um, that puzzling statement at the outset of the story where God said, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, lest you certainly die. That is, before this point, humans were mortal. I'm seeing some nodding heads here. They, they were mortal, but they had a chance to eat of that tree of knowledge. But once they ate of the tree of, I mean, they had a chance to eat of the tree of life and become immortal. But once they eat of the tree of knowledge, God had to send them out and guard the garden from them coming back in. And from that point forward, they will now certainly die. Does that make sense? So what this starts to put forward is even that strange prohibition that God gave, where God said, eat of any tree here in this garden, just don't eat of the tree of knowledge lest you certainly die, is part of this overall picture we have of God in the beginning of trying to provide 
a lush, beautiful, easy, connected life for humans at the outset of creation. It's all part of the picture. God wants them to be able to stay there. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. I don't want to have to send you out. Um, but they do. And this produces um, you know, the results that we see and have walked through. So um, let's think a little bit about contrast now. Um, I've been t I talked at the outset about these Near Eastern, especially Mesopotamian stories uh, that have themes, and you've heard some of them come up here in this, this talk. But there are also some crucial differences between the Garden of Eden story and the precursors that it's responding to. The first, of the first important thing is the Garden of Eden story talks about the process of human creation and our present as being produced by a rupture in the created order that's produced by human disobedience. The rupture being produced by eating the forbidden fruit of knowledge. And this disobedience of humans at the dawn of creation explains the shift from, from an original state of human childlike existence inside a pr primeval garden to the difficult, irrevocably mortal adult life that we all know in our present. And thanks to this garden motif, the Genesis 2 to 3 biblical story depicts central aspects of present reality as a divergence from God's created intent. Remember, with the Mesopotamian creation stories depicted the gods as imposing backbreaking farming labor on humans to relieve lower gods of their work. <coughs> but Genesis 2 to 3 depicts God as originally creating humans for an idyllic life working and gardening God's well-watered watered garden orchard. And that means then <coughs> that the exhausting work that we now know in our present world is not what God divinely intended, but was an outcome of eating the fruit that God had forbidden. That is, agricultural human life is characterized by a permanent fracture between humans on the one hand and the natural world of animals and earth on the other hand. And even the gender inequality of the ancient world and even our present is depicted in this Israelite text as a tragic fracture in God's intended creation. In this way, the Garden of Eden narrative in the Bible avoids merely legitimizing the present world. And instead, it becomes both an explanation of diverse aspects of the present human world, that is, relationships of males and females, animals, farming, reproduction, mortality. It does all that. Our real world is explained. But it's also a vision of God's divinely intended possibilities for something more. In the end, the Garden of Eden story in Genesis 2 to 3 provides a fraught, complicated picture of humanity living outside the garden without the full measure of connectedness to each other and the earth that God intended. But all is not negative. <coughs> At the same time, Genesis 2 to 3 affirms that certain aspects of human life still reflect God's original created intent in the garden, such as the bonds of human beings to each other. Um, the powerful draw of a man to his wife and a wife to the man, the attraction, um, and how that provides for reproduction, allowing humans to survive into future generations despite mortality. Thus, the, the text affirms both the potential for human connection, both the Eden surviving into the present, and the tragedy and reality of alienation in our present. It does both. So where does this leave us in terms of the theme of transformative experience? I would first of all want to emphasize, I'm not arguing here that we have to swallow this story whole. It's an ancient story. It's, it's created in a context of subsistence agriculture where people had to have children all the time and that sort of thing. I mean, it, there are really crucial differences between this story and the present, and we shouldn't just try to import everything into, into our context. That said, I think that this story, though ancient in many ways, contains riches as a way of talking about human tragedy and possibility. Humans as flawed, but with grand potential as well. Um, Quakers, I'm a Quaker, uh, talk, uh, if there's one thing Quakers agree on, which isn't much, um, we have a phrase, there's that of God in every person. 
Um, and there's a sense in which this story wants to affirm that and affirm it in a very particular way. There's that, the thing of God that's in various people, that's in each one of you and in me, is our capacity to decide good and evil, to decide what is f good for, for life and bad for life. And as we all know, if we get in a conversation, we're not going to agree on all that. But that, that internal governor inside us is viewed in this story as that of God in each person. So imagine that. It's quite an idea. Like if, you, if you're in a meeting or a class and there's somebody really annoying you, you know, you're running up against somebody whose sense of what is good and bad is different from your own. And you look into your, uh, their eyes and you realize that even as they're driving you nuts, there's that of God in the very way they're drawing, driving you nuts. Um, at the same time, this story doesn't romanticize that. It's part of a larger story that continues into the next chapter where the first good example besides eating of the fruit. But the first example of humans who've eaten of this fruit is a brother kills his other brother. Cain kills Abel. You know, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> and that's, that suggests that the more we grow into a place where we decide things for ourselves, the more, this story suggests also, we find ourselves outside Eden, living a life of constant toil, vulnerable to shame, conscious of our irresolvably limited mortality. I'd suggest that the world looks different when it's viewed through the lens of this story of transformation. There are, of course, other stories that one could tell about ourselves. We do it, unconsciously or consciously. It's, it's just something, you, you either make choices about it or you don't. For example, we might tell stories where everybody's bad. That's just sort of something we have to deal with. Or some people sort of work with stories or visions of the world which are divided, where basically the world's divided between a group of people who are good and a group of people who, when you really learn about them, are bad. You know, divided up. I live around people who tell stories like that all the time. But I'm uh, suggesting that this biblical story is an interesting alternative where we are all children of Adam and Eve, of the human and the first woman. We are all subject to their same potential for relatedness and connectedness and discernment and vulnerable to their failings. None of us, despite appearances in one instance or another, are just good or just bad, but a mix. A mix of godlike power to discern good and evil, and a vulnerability to using that power for ill. As the next story in the Bible, as I mentioned, the Cain and Abel story illustrates. Now on that note, I'm tempted then to start on a lecture about the Cain and Abel story. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an incredible picture of how the first human, human child murders his, his sibling and also how God has immense compassion for the murderer. Um, but uh, I think I'll stick with the Garden of Eden story and stop now for your questions. Thank you. I realize I covered a lot of ground here, so please serve the group by helping me out with questions of clarification or reflections or something. Brief if you can, <coughs> so that we have time for a few. Yes, sir. I think, I, I don't know what the clink is, but many denominations, especially God's word, Catholic, cling a lot on original sin. Yeah. Not the sin removed <coughs> the, uh, the effects of original sin and so on. And you pointed out that word myth and your definition from Marcus Wolf serves right. But I think there's a definition from Anderson, the scripture scholar Anderson. Bernard Anderson, yeah. Who says a myth is something 
that might have never happened, but keeps on happening all the time. Uh huh. Maybe Marcus ad adapted it from Bernie Anderson's thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And while talking about the transformation, I think that's where you are coming from. It's wonderful. I think maybe we should look at what um, um, Matthew Fox looks at. Rather than looking at the original sin, look at original blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The preternatural state in which the humans were before we even consider the fall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was the common story. Well, that's, uh, I would say that, first of all, one of the things that I think Matthew Fox is doing is reading the Garden of Eden story in relation to the story that comes before, which is where humans are created as images of God and God blesses them, uh, which is another incredibly rich, rich text. Um, I think the thing I find so evocative in this story, I realize I've said it in different ways across the season, is, is the way it holds intention and never lets go of both poles. And doesn't just like say, okay, we're gonna la land on you know, original blessing and everything else is sort of side. Or we're gonna land on original sin, which actually the word sin never occurs in the Garden of Eden story, but be that as it may, we're gonna put it on that. I would argue when we really carefully read this story, it's, we're both, indissolubly both. And people always wanna land on one or the other. They wanna land on one or the other when they're looking at each other and ju judging and saying, you're good, you're bad. They always wanna do that and they wanna do it with the story. And I think part of the richness of the Garden of Eden story is we're both blessed that never went away and lost. Those are both real. Yes. No, I think that's a really good point, that, uh, that part of growing up is also possibly being partnered, of, of finding community, of being, that you can't really go the rest of the way without someone with you, who's a full partner. I find that also very evocative in an ancient text, you know, how, how much it really stresses. It has to be a partner corresponding to the first human, and the only way to do that was to create a, a woman. Um, so, yeah, that's an important component of it, too. Yeah. And by the way, this process of uh, growing up doesn't stop here. Uh, they do discover wine later in the story <laughs> and grow up a little more uh, with, uh, with Noah. So it, that's also, it, there's a way in which the creation story spans multiple chapters of Genesis. So there are lots of dimensions of growing up. Yeah, I do think there's some, there are real similarities between the picture of God in this story and the challenge of parenting, as I touched on briefly. I, I've sometimes said, uh, whoever wrote this story had to have been a parent, because uh, there's just real wisdom in it related to that, and, 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 and sort of reflects God through that prism. Um, but there are just all sorts of, I, re I didn't touch on it, but they're just so, the God in this story is so hard to pin down. Like, 
So did God, in the, is the, did the author mean us to think that the God of the story meant from the outset from hu- for humans to eat of the tree? Because, I mean, it's like putting a cookie jar in the middle of a room <coughs> along with various other healthy foods <laughs> and saying, go ahead to the bunch of kids in there, pig out on everything here, except for those really yummy cookies in the middle, uh, don't touch those or I'll kill you. <laughs> and then leaves the room. <laughs> and like, is it a big surprise that they, they eat of the cookies, you know? So I- in that sense, you think, it, could it all be a setup? But then God seems so upset later at what happened. It's, it's such a complex, complex picture. And I don't think we're ever going to find absolute res- resolution to it. I think part of the magic of the story is that uh, they're loose ends. At least the gradual development of human culture. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right that there are there are definite similarities between the wisdom of this story and what we now know about the gradual development of human and what we now call That's one of the things I'm so struck with. And I wrote this other book on um, sexuality and spirituality in the Bible. And that's one of the things I really ended up honing in on is in terms of the Eden vision, there's something really wrong with putting anyone in a position where they are not with another corresponding partner. And within this story, within that subsistence culture, that was a woman and a man. Okay, that's clear. But Within our culture, that's not always, that doesn't always work for people. And the solution many religious people have to that is to say, well, you can feel whatever you want, just be, be alone. Just be celibate and alone. And I think this story would suggest that's not, a, that's not a full solution. Maybe we need to look in a different way at what it means to correspond to one another. Yeah, why does it de- de- depart from these earlier stories? I mean, they depart from each other, too. Each of these writers wasn't just interested in repeating an earlier story, but had their own thing to add. And I would argue, I, I mean, I don't know for, for sure in general, but I think going back to what I touched on toward the end and ways this diverges, um, this author wanted to say that certain crucial aspects of our created order weren't what God originally meant to happen, that God, th- there was another vision God had, had about, had, and, and the way we got to where we are was a result of the human choice for wisdom. Uh, that was something that was important to this author. Uh, and so they put this, this te- that's the way, the way they open their story. And then the story continues, of course, into the Cain and Abel story and others too, which each have their own dimension um, to them in terms of trying to talk about what it means to be human and to be civilized and so on. No, I mean like if I could compare, say I mentioned Amos before, you know, some of the prophets, you can much more clearly see the time spe- specificity of what they had to say and it helps you understand that text better sometimes to know the, the situation they were addressing and that kind of thing. People have tried sometimes to come up with specific dating of this story um, and link it to various situations. I, would, I, I have my own ideas about when it was dated, but in this case I don't see that as crucial, as crucial to understanding 
what the story is about, as I do with big prophetic texts. In that sense, it's, it's, it's much more kind of like a wisdom text. It's not technically a wisdom text, though it talks about wisdom, but it, it's sort of timeless in that, its claim. At least within the logic of this story, yeah. yeah. Do you have thoughts about what that means for like the um, like youth rights or the agency of children and uh, mm -hmm. you know, like not adults that we have all these markers for what adulthood is? Like it may seem like in some cultures that this this is like being treated as worse because you can be an adult and you can buy and sell things. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question that I probably need to think a bit more about. Um, my initial thought off the top would be, I think this story has a little more to tell us more about adults, but it also might provide markers for us to be attentive to instead of just rigidly saying you're an adult when this happens I and mean, when you reach this age or whatever. Maybe being more attentive to that crucial shift of knowing good and evil. And here I'm thinking of, uh, for example, some of the, and I don't know the politics of everybody in the room, so forgive me on this, uh, but I've been moved by um, the teenagers at the high school in Florida who've really provided leadership in a way on gun control that has hasn't been listened to at least or been as effective at when it's been done by many other people. And they're not old enough to qualify as adults in terms of voting and a bunch of other stuff. But nevertheless, I would want to say in terms of the Garden of Eden story, in terms of the markers it provides, to, it, they're not quite children perhaps in the way you're thinking, but they're claiming agency. And it's powerful. And this story would, I think, urge us to recognize that and for what it is. That they're adults in the every important way. And in this sense, then I would argue a good one, my sense. Yeah. I realize I, I was committed to um, closing things off around this time, but I'm going to be going up to the reception in a few minutes and would love to talk with some of you more about this. But thank you very much for your attention.